This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. Hang on a second, I think I've got some settings all Bear with me. You sound good? You sound very clear? Okay, there we go. There yeah. we go. That way, uh, you you will not bleed through. It was coming through my my speakers instead of my headphones. But how you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I just spent a couple of days with my boy um, on the Isle of Wight. Um, because he lives with his mum, so I'm divorced. I've uh, been divorced for 10 yeah. years, so I go and see him every now and again when I can. And we had a great day. <laughs> so, um, he's a... He's turned into a horror fan, you know? He's, oh, that's got to do you proud. It is. Um, different, because he's 12 years old. He's different, very different to how I was when I was 12, year old, 12 years old, because I was terrified by Jaws, shall we say. And <laughs> me and him were swimming in the sea yesterday, you know. I said, hey, do you want to go for a swim? Yeah, let's do it, you know. And I was swimming and he says to me, hey, Dad, wouldn't it be cool if Jaws turned up now? <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, seriously, kid? You know, <laughs> I don't know about that. that it, it would be fun to watch Jaws in the ocean, but... I don't know that you want the the real thing swimming around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. So it's uh, <laughs> it's like I'm still terrified by that. But he's he's seen all four movies, and funny enough, he says that number four isn't very good. Number three isn't that great, but number one's the best, and uh, number two is uh. okay. So yeah, he's his mind has has interpreted it the way we do, I guess. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think also it's just tough to argue that, like, oh, boy, Jaws 3 really is the best, you know? Like, mm. it, it, I, I think that's a hard conclusion to reach at any age or any generation. Yeah, yeah, but he's, you know, he's into all these. He, he loves, uh, he's, he, he watches The Walking Dead, which he stumbled upon. Wow. By accident, and he watched it, and he said, "Dad, that's pretty cool. I like it." You know, so I was like, "Okay, you know, twelve years old, he's enjoying horror. Who am I to say? Do you know what I mean?" It's <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I got to tell you, uh, maybe I'm not the the best example or anything, but like, I started at like five. Yeah. You know, watching some pretty raw shit. So, um, you know, I mean, not. I spit on your grave, but oh, yeah, sure. you know, yeah, I yeah. I saw like Halloween and Alien before <laughs> I was seven, mm -hmm. so you know, I'm oh, not wow. that broken. Oh, wow, yeah, I mean, it, it, the thing is with me is it's funny. The film that we're going to be talking today is my dad introduced that to me probably about seven or eight, and um, every I watched it this morning just before we you know recording the show now. And uh -huh. I still have cinema trauma from this movie. It gives me a little bit of a, ooh, ooh, that takes me back to being eight when my dad brought it home on VHS, you know. It's like, woo. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, crazy. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, and I think that's why, you know, we're here today to talk about films and, you know, why us horror guys love these movies and it takes us back to those times and, I hear it quite a lot from fellow podcasters, in, including yourself, you know, um, some nostalgia and things like that. Oh, for sure. You know, there, there's, you know, like I, I have my comfort movies the same way that I, I like comfort food from time to time. Mm. Um, and, you know, like, like Jaws is a movie that feels incredibly relaxing to me yeah. like as, as as tense as the movie is and all that stuff like watching that movie gives me such a warm feeling 
uh, because I know that, like, as many times as I've seen it, I know I'm still going to love it when I, I get to the end of it. Yeah, I oh, know. Yeah, and I like the way you used the word comfort. That's another word I've heard throughout fellow, you know, legionnaire, you know, legion podcasters. And uh, for me, it's uh, one of those comfort movies is The Burbs, Joe Dante's The Burbs. For some reason, I, every time I watch that, I feel like I'm in that weld. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I've got some weird ones like uh, um, uh, the Better Off Dead, that John Cusack movie, incredibly oh, yeah. comforting for me because yeah. I just watched it a million times when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when I go back and watch it now, it's just like, ah, uh, yes, I like all of this is very familiar. It reminds me of, you know, a time in my life when I wasn't so close to death. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I totally get that. And I, and the funny thing is, I've, I've had times where um, I've been out, uh, I could have had a shitty day, whether that's work-related or something else, and at that very moment, I think to myself, Jesus Christ, I need Fright Night right now. I need to stick yeah. Fright Night on, just, just, go, just go and fuck off into that world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, that, that's one for me as well. Also, uh uh, Night of the Creeps will, oh, yeah. will do that for me as well. Yeah, if yeah. I'm just like, man, I just need something on in the background that is like I can stop and watch ten minutes of, and and it's gonna make me feel like a human being again. <laughs> uh, that's a terrific movie. Good old Tom Atkins in that movie. Oh my god, <laughs> it, man, it's it's just one of those things that we we don't deserve as a species. Mm. Is how good Tom Atkins is in yeah. in. Night of the Creeps. It, oh yeah, he's so fucking good in it. Uh, the yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole speech he has about like, you know, here's what I did when you know I tracked down this girl I loved and found this killer. Yeah. Uh, when he's given that speech and <laughs> uh, and he tells the kid like, and uh, and so I came across him in that in the car, and you know what happened next, P -P -P Spanky. Are you sure you be you should be telling me this? <laughs> Wrong. You know, just not even listening to him. Just answering questions that, you know, answering his own question, w not paying any attention at all to the other part of the conversation, just lost in his own world. Such a good performance. It's, and it, it's, it seems to be able to charm every woman with that push broom moustache, doesn't he? And, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, man. I'm telling you, it's, oh. uh, it's something else. I've got a. I, I, um, I have this conversation with um, my my missus Becky, and she says, "You know, it's okay. I'll give you a license to have a man crush." And Tom Atkins is certainly on that man crush list. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> any yeah. day of the week. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Tom Tom Atkins and uh, you know, and probably Brad Pitt and uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh right, I yeah, know. Okay, yeah. You know, he's like. <laughs> 60 years old when we whips off that shirt and climbs the roof i'm like god damn what a what an incredibly sexy man i was like that's a level of that's a level of sexiness i can't even aspire to it's not, like it feels like he's from a different different alien race yeah, or something maybe where he is. Like, yeah that's holy it. holy god how do you have how do you have a six pack at 60 that doesn't make any sense Ah, that, yeah, it's not right. Uh, it's not right, but everything's right about it at the same time. You know what, Bo? I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna keep all of this in, and anybody that's <laughs> listening, no, anybody that's listening right now, because I'm doing the Twilight Zone. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because I'm doing. I'm taking. We're gonna take you to that fifth dimension today. So what I'm gonna do now is actually introduce the show, like I was supposed to do ten minutes ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're listening to a podcast of not only sight and sound, but of mind. Of mind. So, welcome to Bite Size Cinema, guys. There you go. It's a little bit different today. Um, I'm your host, RJ McCready, and as you already know, I've got Bo Ranzel on the show, and we've spoken about some great stuff, as we always do, because I find that when we do these episodes, the best stuff is that first 10 minutes of the show when we say, how are you doing? And I'm just... So glad I punched that record button. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it, it's important to have my my crush on Brad Pitt and Once Upon a, a Time in Hollywood recorded yeah. for posterity. I'll uh, 
I'll, I'll be sure to clip that part out for my girlfriend. I think, in fairness, I feel like she's already heard it. Yeah. I, but, that, that's something I feel like I've said to her because it just drives me crazy. Well, it would be criminal now for me to edit, to the, edit that out, so I'm not going to. So there you go. That is published for the world to listen to about you and Brad Pitt and me and Tom Atkins and Man Crush and all that sort of stuff. Um, but before we actually get into the actual Twilight Zone, I did notice, we, we've already mentioned Jaws, uh, pick six movies... Um, Howard the Duck, <laughs> as you mentioned. <laughs> we'll chuck oh, that one yeah. in there quick. <laughs> oh, man. What a terrible, terrible movie that is. <laughs> uh, yeah, and like I I am pretty sympathetic. Like We just recorded the, the new episode on Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance and slight spoilers. Yeah. Um, there are things I genuinely enjoy about that movie. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think Nicolas Cage actually gives a fun performance in that. But... Uh, Howard the Duck is just such a weird mishmash of bad ideas. Mm. None of them pay off. It, it It's one of the few movies I've ever seen where I'm like, I don't know that there's anything in this movie for anybody. It really, <laughs> it, it, it really took me back. Well, I covered that with uh, Ricky Morgan and Gary Hill on Dude Looks Like the 80s. Um, when I first started podcasting, when... when uh, Ricky Morgan lured me into this world, which I, I'm still there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's kind of lured me into the Twilight Zone, I suppose you could say. You know, for any sort of pun there. And I remember Gary Hill just, he just, Gary does that thing sometimes where he just says it in two seconds without you realising. He said, "You know what? With how the duck, he says, it's the only movie where you get duck titties in the first like 30 seconds." <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Right, like yeah. uh, again, who is this for? Who, yeah. who, who in the audience was like, you know, what we need to see, duck tits. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, I remember this film because uh, I lived opposite a cinema when I was growing up, and I saw the poster for it, and I thought, well, look, there's a kids kids movie. There's a duck. It's got um, George Lucas's name on it. You know, this has got to be kid friendly. You could imagine all these, yeah. you know, parents taking because this. I think it came out around about July time. All these yeah. parents taking their kids go go and take you know you go and see this duck movie, and then you got that at the beginning, and you know you got a you got a Howard the Duck rubber in it as well, haven't you? you know? <laughs> yeah, he's just trying. He's constantly trying to get it wet in that movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and oh yeah, it's it, it, head scratching. That, that uh, truly one of one of the most bizarre, unfortunate films I've yeah. ever seen in my life. And then moving on to the, the other, you know, Ghost Rider, because um, I noticed that episode pick six movies. I heard you guys talking about it. I just thought I've had this conversation many a time with Dan Bone. Little shout out to him from podcast on Haunted Hill. Um, how many films Nicolas Cage has actually been in? Do you know what I mean? When you think about it, that guy's been absolutely everywhere, isn't he? In all sorts of genres yeah. and, you know. Um, uh, you know, amazing. Prisoners for a Ghostland, that trailer just dropped. The yeah. new Sion Sono film, and that looks appropriately bonkers. Like, they're. Yeah, I mean, Nicolas Cage had his tax problems and all that, mm. and I think that he's sort of. You got to think he's paid that off, and now it's just because, you know, he's an actor. He, he yeah. likes to work. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I think it's that old phrase, isn't it? You know, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's like throw enough shit at the wall and somebody might stick, you know? I mean, that's kind of what yeah, it goes and, for, you know? <laughs> and, and there are very few movies, and granted, I haven't watched a lot of the, you know, direct-to-video Nicolas Cage mm. Taken-style thrillers or anything. I haven't watched a lot of those. I, I you know, I kind of cherry-pick my Nicolas Cage movies, because you're right, he does about six a year, and mm. one of them will be good. And But the one that's good, like, I've never, I've never seen Nicolas Cage not try. No. And even in a bad movie, he's generally going to be the best part of it. Yeah. And then you, you marry him with the right, you know, script and the right directors and like something like Pig that just came out. Pig is a beautiful film and, and he's amazing in it. Like it's an Oscar caliber performance. And 
that's like that's what you get out of Nicolas Cage. Like, if he does a shitty movie, he'll be the best thing about that shitty movie. But if you put him in an actual good movie, he can elevate yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. And I, I can't wait to see this Sion Sono movie. It looks yeah. it looks nuts in the way that a Sion Sono movie looks nuts. So it, yeah. I'm excited. And it's absolutely right. You, you can go from being um, in a very sort of very well tuned movie, like you say, with Pig. I haven't seen that yet, but I've heard very good things about it. Um, but I know about what he's done before. He's done things like Raising Arizona. Um, and then he's done films like The Rock, Big Hollywood with Blockbusters. Um, and then he does something like Mandy, um, you know, which comes out, which is, you know, it's. I, I, I enjoyed that. And then, you know, it will just chuck it in there, Willie's Wonderland. Um, but, it, right. you know, it's just. Yeah, I've I've got to respect the guy. Do you know what I mean? I think you know he's he's happy to turn his hand. He's a real craftsman. If you know what I mean, you know he picks up his tool bag and goes, "Come on, then, guys, let's just let's do this." You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, let's get on yeah. with this. You know, <laughs> like if you if you pay his salary, he yeah. will show up and give you a performance. Yeah. And what yeah. you what you as a filmmaker make of that <clears throat> is kind of up to you. Like if you put him on a little bit of a leash. And, 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 you know, again, I'll be in this in a negative way or anything, but if you kind of guide his natural impulses uh, into the per- the performance that you want, I think you can get real genius out of him. And I think, that, like, Willy's Wonderland is an example of you just let him show up and be Nicolas Cage, yeah. and he just shows up and is Nicolas Cage. Or you do a thing like, you know, Pig, where you have him very subdued and very quiet and giving a much more restrained performance and you get something really special out of mm. that so uh, he's he's great i love nicholas cage yeah i'm always gonna have a soft spot for nicholas cage I always have done since since i was young like i say looking at his early stuff and then during the 90s he certainly entertained me because i went to the cinema and watched watch all his films and um yeah yeah, no. So, in fact, this is turning into the Nicholas Cage podcast. He always does that. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 like our, our running themes now are Kurt Russell and Nicholas Cage. It is, and yeah, that's right. Absolutely nothing wrong with either of those. Yeah, and welcome everybody. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the hairstyles of Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I just started combing it back. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I love that guy, but I'm also I'm really excited to talk about the Twilight Zone because yes. I have yeah I have very conflicting opinions about the Twilight Zone. Like Ooh. you know, old old hot takes Ransdell serving them up hot today. Yeah, um, yeah. there we'll we'll get into it, but I there are things I love about mm-hmm. Twilight Zone the movie, and there are things about it that I'm I just don't quite un- understand. Yep. Okay, so I think this is a good time to uh, take you guys to the fifth dimension. We'll play you a trailer, and we'll be back soon. On June 24th, four acclaimed directors, George Miller, John Landis... Joe Dante and Steven Spielberg take you to another dimension. Welcome back, guys. So, um, we just played you a trailer. Um, so, the synopsis of this film is uh, four horror and sci fi segments directed by four famous directors, each of them being a vision or a version of a classic story from Rod Serling's landmark television, television series. I put my teeth back in there. Um, it's a horror sci fi, it's got 6.5 on IMBD, came out in 1983. And it's got a running time of 98 minutes. So, Bo, The Twilight Zone. Wow, what a yes. movie, eh? <laughs> what a weird movie. What a weird and strange and wonderful movie. Which, before I say anything else, I think it deserves its place in horror and sci-fi. But let's talk about this film. 
Um, what? Yeah, what's I, this do for you? I, all right. <laughs> yeah, let me. All right, let me start off with yeah. with problem number one I have mm-hmm. with this movie is uh, that it positions itself because of that opening John Landis sequence, yep. which feels incredibly American werewolf to me. And I think it's maybe the long shot of the car coming around the side of the mountain and everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you start off with Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd in a car and they're singing and, and they get to uh, the the kind of classic moment of, you know, hey, you want to see something really scary? Mm-hmm. Um, which I like. I like all of that stuff. But I think one of the first disconnects I have with the film is that when I think of the Twilight Zone, I don't necessarily think of them being horror stories. Yeah. Um, some of them are, but the vast majority are more like these parables about human nature. Yeah. And and I think kind of at its best, the classic Twilight Zone, you know, the stuff like the monsters are due on Mulberry Street. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, funny, funny you, you say know, that. There's, Sorry, funny you say that. I'll get go, back to that in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> go, 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 go. Oh, no, 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 no. I feel, feel like you just walked over my grave. That was supposed to have been Spielberg's segment remake. I don't know if you knew that or not, or whether that's just a. Yeah. I did not know that, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a terrific, mm. uh, a, a terrific episode. There's the one, I don't even remember the name of it, where Robert Redford plays Death. Yeah. And comes for the old woman in the basement and all that stuff. Like, those are the things I associate most with Twilight Zone, not necessarily uh, a show that is out and out scary. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, there are, there are those episodes, but I, I feel like that's kind of the rarity. And so when you have this conversation in the car about how scary Twilight Zone is, I was like, well, is it? Really? Because that's not... And even the film... And I think this is, again, one of those disconnects where the film itself starts off positioning itself as a horror film and then quickly becomes something else entirely. And there's a a couple of, you know, scary segments, notably the last George Miller one. But for the most part, it's like I I don't think you're, you're branding the Twilight Zone the right way. Yeah, um, I do agree with you because I think um, Twilight Zone, the movie as a film, is very um, doesn't really know what it wants to be. I don't know whether that's because you've got a conflict of four different directors here, very good directors. Uh, as we've already mentioned, John Landis, who was riding high on American Werewolf in London. Uh, Steven Spielberg, well, we don't have to say anything more about that with uh, sure, yeah. you know everything that he was doing. Um, then Joe Dante, The Howling, um, and then obviously George Miller who had who did uh, Mad Max. And I think when I mentioned George Miller with the Twilight Zone, I think a lot of people were surprised that he's actually in this. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I I'm going to get this out of the way. Kick the cans, not my favourite segment. Um, it's Steven Spielberg. No way I'm going to knock him. I just feel like it's just probably more amazing stories segment um, uh, for me um, and yeah, I, I for think sure. you're right I think I do like the segment at the beginning I think it's classic with um, uh, Dan Aykroyd where he says you know do you want to see something really scary and watching it now as an adult you think oh this is pitched as a horror movie um, and then it goes into like say uh, uh, um, like say kick the can you think hang on a second I think it would have been better well, if you had f- terror at 30,000 feet, possibly, after that. You know, just to sort of really ramp this up after that beginning segment, you know. <laughs> or or just do, if like, if you're going to say, hey, this is a, a horror story, or like Twilight Zone is all about horror stories, you could do Nightmare at 20,000 feet. You could do, uh, th- like, the one with the old woman and the little robot uh, terrorizing mm. her. Mm. And you could, I mean, there's a handful of those that you could do. You could even do a more horror spin on the alien at the diner, you know, oh, episode yeah. or yeah, something I remember like that. that. I do remember these, yeah. Um, and yeah, but I, I think the problem is that you spin from, 
hey, you want to see something really scary and then monster face into this parable about racism and bigotry with Vic Morrow, which, you know, of course, this is the tragic one where Vic Morrow, as well as uh, uh, a couple of other stunt people lost their lives yeah. um, in the in the filming of it. But that aside, it it feels like you shift into something that isn't remotely scary. It's just about a dude who's racist and then gets his comeuppance. Yeah, um, I think, because I had a look at a documentary for Ron Serling, and he's, the, well, basically what they're saying is, the actual building block of the Twilight Zone is he is a World War II veteran um, who came back with uh, what they called shell shock at the time, and then he had PTSD. And he was a writer for Hollywood, and he said to Hollywood, I want to I want to talk about that shell shock that I had after World War Two. And his stories were very broad, very politically broad in terms of what the Americans did um, in, in Japan and what the Japanese did to the Americans and the horrors of war and all that sort of stuff. And Hollywood at the time basically said to him, uh, Rod, yeah, you've got some great material here, but this is a little bit too hard, you know what I mean? We Oh, we're not going to green like that. So he went away, and then he came back, and he said, "Well, how, what about if I put a sci-fi horror spin on it?" You know. So he's basically saying that an alien can probably say an opinion that a Democrat and a Republican can't say, and that was kind of like his take on the Twilight Zone. So with the when I watched the Time Out uh, episode when it was dealing with you know racism, the unnecessaries of that. You know, human behaviour in that. Um, I kind of got, <clears throat> I kind of got that. I could sort of see what John Landis was doing there, just to sort of put that spin on this. But um, as you mentioned, the unfortunate thing here with Vic Morale dying um, caused a rift between John, John Landis and Steven Spielberg. And uh, Spielberg was supposed to have done that uh, segment that used to, was it the. Um, Alien Invasion Mine. in the street, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had that down. He said, that's the one I'm going to be doing. But then when Vic Morale died, he said, no, I'm not going to do that because it's going to involve too much. Um, I think it was more to do with the special effects that he wanted to use, which was quite dangerous back then. <laughs> yeah, I think it was the old, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the old Wild West ways of, you know, directing in Hollywood and stuff. So then he, he, he created this... Um, kind of like nicey nicey story about kick the can which i think as you said kind of throws you off do you know what i mean you think oh hang on a second yeah you know, um yeah <clears throat> yeah so but there I, is you know kind of, I, hmm. I but I, I i kind of feel like that happens with like I, immediately in that big Mo moro story i'm like oh okay so this isn't an actual horror movie this is Instead, the, this is a movie that is about, you know, uh, social, like it, it social is a problems, twilight, it? It, right? It's mm -hmm. social commentary, and mm -hmm. they, and you're right. Like I, I've done a little bit of research uh, w when it comes to Rod Serling, who was a fascinating guy. Yeah, and and like you said, you know, he was a dude that was much more concerned with being an honest to goodness writer and examining the human condition and all that stuff and just kind of couched all of that uh within um within the these you know supernatural uh at time stories and so you know i think the big morrow story is kind of fine but also one of the weaker segments yeah. because it yeah. doesn't i i don't think the payoff is very good mm. You know, like, yes, he ends up being carted away to Auschwitz, but okay. Uh, I guess, I guess if you're racist and in, in, in a bar, that's what you deserve. But I don't know, man. It, like, it never feels like he learns his lesson. It no. just feels like a, he's a bad person and then a bunch of bad shit happens. To Absolutely. Him. And I think he'd be the sort of bloke that if he had a wad of cash in his, in his pocket, he'll just get it out and try and pay his way out and get his mates to come over and get him out. And he'll still be the same person. Yeah. Um, so you never really get to see that, whether he's actually changed or not. Do you really? He's just shitting his pants. Yeah. Cause he's in this train. And he can't get out. 
Yeah, yeah, like I for my money, you need that moment where he's like sees himself in the mirror yes. and yeah. he's black. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, well then it's a walk a mile in, in someone's shoes kind of story. And that would be way more interesting to me. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's because of the... It might just be to do with the actual fact that they only had a certain amount of footage that they had to cut. It might have been Landis thinking, well, we've got to try and finish this. Um, I think there was a segment where he's supposed to rescue two children um, that was written into it, and I don't think they could finish it because, obviously, he unfortunately passed away with this sort of accident. Um, yeah. So it could just be that. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a shame. It's really a shame because, you know, like I say, John Landis was riding high on, you know, success of American Werewolf in London and it kind of sport his relationship with Spielberg. So uh, there was a mo there could have been a moment of greatness here, I think, but unfortunately we had this accident, which was God awful by the way. But, um, but then, um, the, when I think of the Twilight Zone, the movie, um, just putting these two first two segments aside, for me, all of a sudden you've got Joe Dante who turns up. It, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, and it's kind of like, hey guys, I'm I'm still here. And guess what? I've got Rob Boateen with me. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, right, okay. And, you know, there's some really good special effects in his, uh, you know, life's... It's, it's a good life, you know. And yeah. And cr creepy kids... I find something really unsettling about this episode for me. <laughs> oh, fucking, you know. Uh, I, yeah. I, oh, all right. So here, here's hot take number two. Yeah. Um, I think that it is totally fine. Yeah. I, I think the the front end of it is really good. Mm. The the this uh, particular segment with the kid. I think everything up to. And including the girl getting put into the, the TV cartoon world. Mm. All of that stuff works for me. I just think the ending of the segment is kind of crap. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it just kind of yeah. ends with a wet fart. <laughs> it I, doesn't... I, yeah, yeah, go ahead, but, sorry. Uh, no, no, you're right. Because, I, I, yeah, there is that, I suppose for me, because I'm watching it from um, uh, seven or eight-year-old RJ McCready, and I think... I think sometimes when you have film nostalgia, it kind of overshadows. I suppose from a seven or eight year old, it doesn't really. I suppose you forget about the story. You just think about the actual, like, fucking scares you got. You know, especially with the girl with the. He's missing her mouth, isn't it? In the yeah, the yeah, oh, that's super creepy. Yeah, the hell, the yeah. rabbit monster. And yeah. I'll tell you, one of the creepiest moments when I went back and watched it again was. The as soon as she, uh, Kath Kathleen Quinlan goes upstairs with the kid, hmm. the way that everybody rifles through her purse, yeah, just looking for anything that might get them out of the situation or just give them like something other than this hell that they're trapped in, yeah. And I think that's really fun and creepy. Um, and I think most of the segment is, you know, I like I think I think most of it works really well. Again, up in up until the resolution where it's like, well, I guess the fact that he murdered and and banished all these people to the Phantom Zone or whatever, I guess that's cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we're I'll just gonna like, you know, we're gonna you know sort of wipe the the blackboard clean on this kid and be like, okay, whatever whatever horrifying murders you committed in the past, that's in the past. So let's just move forward and hope that you don't do the same thing again. And we're just going to drive away with flowers coming out of the ground <laughs> into the sunset. <laughs> yeah, it, it like it's way too <clears throat> nice an ending for this horrible monster of a child. Mm. Um, but I mean, again, I I get it. Uh, I understand why you want to kind of wrap it up in a way that isn't you know we've got to murder this little boy. But but also it does feel a little it it feels like he's getting off easy. Yeah, and... um, it, it's I think it's in this case I think it's got good you know for the segment that it is because stories have beginning, middle, the end you know it's a small segment but I think it's got a good first half with Dick Miller 
Um, you've got obviously you've got some, you know, Joe Dante royalty here, Kevin McCarthy that turns up in his films. Um, but like I say, I think the third act, I think it just stumbled, didn't it? I don't think they knew how to end this film. It's, you know, well, how, what do we do with this film now? You know, it's got some good special effects, we've got some creepy scenes, but how the hell do we end it? Um, yeah. So yeah, it does fall victim to that. When you, we're, now we're discussing it and talking about it, it's, these, 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 are, these are good discussions. Uh, these are yeah, and you're right. Films, Kevin yeah. McCarthy is so good in this. I'm a I'm mm. a fan of his anyway, yeah. but he's so much fun. Mm. Uh, I like I love the moment in it. Uh, you know, th- th- I, I would probably, if I were ranking all the segments of this, this is probably my second favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, with Kick the Can probably being third. I think it almost goes in like ascending order for me. Mm. Where the first one I don't I don't really care for very much. Kick the Can I think is kind of fine. It's it's very Spielberg. And like you said, it feels like it could have been an amazing stories episode. Yeah. And yeah. And and would have been perfectly appropriate in, in that environment. I'm just I'm partial to Scatman Crothers, so oh, yeah. anytime yeah, yeah. he shows up and yeah. is like I'm gonna kick the can, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yes, let's let's play Scatman Crothers. Um, but yeah, and I think the I think when you get to the Joe Dante Evil Kid segment, uh, I do like all those performances. I like how they these family so called family members, uh, which we later learn, you know, are his real parents. He's just kind of you know stolen people to to serve these roles. Yeah. Um, when they when he finds the note that says like he's a monster help us and everybody immediately turns on each other like i didn't do that it was her it was the you know it, it was your fake sister that she's the one who did it uh, uh yeah. and i i like that stuff and and like you said i think that it's just got third act problems where it doesn't it doesn't feel like the guilty have been punished and that is one of the Sam Raimi rules of of filmmaking, mm-hmm. uh, technically horror. He said the dead must walk and the guilty must be punished, and then the third is a variable. Right. Uh, but in this case, just for straight up filmmaking, it just doesn't. It doesn't feel like uh, it it ends in a satisfying way, and that that's frustrating because it it, it so it could have been so much better if there had been you know, some, some other way to make this shot, like to somehow take away his powers or something, have him wish for that. And yeah. then he could just be a normal boy. And then maybe you got something. Yeah. Because, um, what you just said there with the Ra- uh, Sam Raimi, uh, formula. And I've thought about this before with, especially with reviewing films now is I think sometimes a film, the, the actual final third scene payoff is vital as much as the first and second act because if you ain't got that payoff the payoff is the bit that you remember you know it's that explosion at the end and you come out of the cinema and go ooh that was a hell of an ending you know and um, I don't think you quite get that with this but you do get other good bits say with um, Boutine's uh, special effects which I still think hold up quite well today you know especially with that sort of Tasmanian devil type creature that comes yeah. out from you know this is Boutine he's He's obviously got quite a good relationship with Joe Dante, and Joe's gone, you know, go on, boating, just do your stuff. And he's like, yeah, okay, man, you know, these sort of wavy logs, you know, so yeah, okay, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to totally sort of fuck up Disney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, hey, how about, how about you make a horrifying rabbit monster yeah. that comes out of this hat? And, yeah, great. Yeah, and I like, oh. I like how all of that <clears throat> stuff looks kind of vaguely cartoonish. Mm. And yeah, it's like that stuff is really cool. Yeah, I wish, yeah. I wish so much that it it landed a little bit better, mm-hmm. and it would be a pretty phenomenal segment. Uh, but yeah. just as it stands, I, I think I think there are really great things about it. It just doesn't ever totally gel. Yeah, and uh, not to forget, I've got to mention uh, Nancy Cartwright in this as well. The little girl who gets plunged into the TV. And it's really yeah. funny because it's weird how she gets plunged in the TV with the cartoons because she ends up doing the voice for Bart Simpson. Um, so that's that's her. right. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a 
Um, you know, it's almost like there's a bit of a prophecy there for her as a, <laughs> as, a as an actress. Um, um and which uh, which kind of brings us to the final segment, which is in my mind far and away the best. Yeah. Like yeah. The, if you had wanted to do like a horror style Twilight Zone movie, just give it all to George Miller. Yep. Yeah, he's basically just rolled up his sleeves and goes, right, 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 let's do it. And, you know, and he and he blows out of the water. And for me, I think this is probably the most memorable one. I think it, I think when I say Twilight Zone movie, I think a lot of people think of Terror at 30,000 Feet with an incredible performance from uh, John Lithgow. Um, and I think uh, this really does have a very good beginning, middle and an end, um, just the way the whole thing rolls out. Um, yeah you know a hundred percent yeah yeah it, it's yeah it's so good mm -hmm. so good like you said it's it's you've got your john lithgow who is you know in his de palma years when he just gets to be weird on screen mm. a and and he's he's fantastic as this you know overly uh anxious flyer <laughs> um and it's got such fun detail, like the the little girl that's taking pictures of him and yeah. being a general pest, and uh, the the dude sitting in front of him, uh, looking back at him with the stink eye all the time and everything. Yeah. And even the the flight attendant that kind of sits down with him, like those moments when she's like, you know, you're gonna be okay. He's like, yeah, I guess I didn't see anything at all. Uh, and you're like, yeah, that these are two, tr you know, like John Lithgow's a rational person. He he's possessed of this, you know, phobia that makes him act erratically. Yeah. But he's also he acknowledges that he's like, you know, when he first <laughs> see, sees the thing on the wing of the plane <laughs> and freaks out, there's something on the wing. <laughs> uh, yeah. After all that stuff, and he sits down with the the flight attendant, and he's like. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I I wondered how somebody could still be hanging onto the plane. Maybe it's a uh, uh, like a worker or something, but that would be impossible because the air's too thin and it's too cold, and the plane's going too fast, and the wind shear would take him right off. So I guess it's impossible then. And he kind of talks himself like he logics mm -hmm. his way mm -hmm. to a rational thought. But yeah. the problem yeah. is that despite his rational thought, there's an honest to goodness gremlin on the plane. Yep. We fucking shit up. And <laughs> yeah, it's so, oh, it's so good. I think um, it's worth mentioning here as well with uh, John Lithgow's performance. Uh, it does feel like him as a, as, as, a, as a character is that you are flying through the sky with him up and down. Do you know what I mean? One minute he's, one minute he's going, yeah, I'm okay. Like you just said, you know, I must be seeing things. And as an audience, you feel like you're calming with him. And all of a sudden, he's like, that curiosity, I've got to look out the window, and he opens up the slide, and there's a gremlin looking at him, and you're thinking, oh, shit. And then all of a sudden, we've got Jim, John Lithgow's character. Boom, that's it. His heart rate's gone through the roof. He's sweating. He's back to how he was again. Um, the other thing I was going to mention here as well, I think I noticed it this time around, was the actual um, cinematography of camera angles so as it starts you've got the camera which pans down him from an aerial point of view and i just notice little things like that i just it just gives you that sort of it, it almost makes you feel a little bit vertigo as an audience you know one minute you're you, you're seeing him from as if you're on the floor and then you're sort of panning up and then you're seeing it from outside the plane i just thought that just little details like that are very good, which really brings us all together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I mean it, it's testament to how good George Miller is as a director mm. that he knows how to kind of ratchet that tension up. And yeah. as the segment goes along, the Dutch angles get more severe, and the close-ups and the zooms are are bouncing all over the place, yeah. and it creates this really frenetic kind of energy like you go along with John Lithgow like your your level of anxiety and and sort of that kinetic energy rises with that character hmm. and and so as he's freaking out 
you're getting really tense and nervous because of the way the cameras are moving. And like I said, there are these quick zooms on Lithgow or onto the, you know, what he's seeing on the wing of the plane. And there's, you know, that whole sequence where John Lithgow is like, just trying to like, you know what? I'm just going to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to worry about this. And, you know, he keeps looking at the closed window and, for my money, there is nothing more frightening than a closed door or window yeah. when you suspect that there's something on the other side yeah. of it. Yeah, it's, it's the old classic uh, film trick, isn't it? And it, it stays with me because I'm in the bathroom when I'm cleaning my teeth. I've got a cabinet with a mirror on it. And yeah. you open it up and you've got all your toothpaste and you know shaving cream and everything. And I still today, I shit you not, close the door with the mirror thinking that something's going to be stood behind me you know, <laughs> you know oh, yeah every yeah. damn fucking time <laughs> you know? for sure i like i have this weird fear of uh <laughs> of opening my garage door yeah. <laughs> and and having and seeing someone or something running from the woods behind my house straight at me all oh, right, <laughs> and and it, it's a weird like some somewhere in history that <clears> image <throat> got stuck in my craw, and now every time I open the garage door, especially at night, if I'm open the garage door at night, I I, I half expect that there's going to be some you know <laughs> uh, some ill-meaning creature hauling ass from. <laughs> The wood line uh, to me. You know the and what the you know what the first thought that comes to mind here, Bo, is a naked Duncan McLeish jumping out. Yeah, <laughs> what? I think that's where it started. Help he me, made a Bo. Trip special, yeah. I've been turned into a werewolf. <laughs> I mean, he, yeah. to, he doesn't have to turn into a monster to be frightening. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw that one in there as the first thought that comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be genuinely terrifying. Ah. <laughs> um, but I do, I, I do get that because um, I also have that fear as well. I think a lot of people do when you ask them as well. Because um, when I get up to go for a piss at night, my toilet's downstairs, and you've got to walk through the kitchen, and I've got a big sort of kitchen window looking out into the garden, and. Every damn time I walk past it, I'm expecting there to be a fucking monster with red eyes looking through the fucking windows, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I think it's probably watching films like this that have probably injected that fear into me um, from a sort of uh, cinema trauma thing. And, yeah, I, I think with this segment, I think, to be honest with you, and I was thinking about this the other day when I was uh, driving back uh, from seeing my boy, because I always, you know, if I'm doing a podcast, I'm sort of running things through my mind. I think if you didn't have Terror in 30,000 feet, um, I don't think I'll be talking about this film today. Because um, I think this film's really just George Miller. And this is no discredit to the other directors. But I think his segment has kind of saved the day, you know. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I think if all the segments were as good as this, I think you'd have a real solid, solid movie. Yeah, for sure. Like George Miller is the one who who knocks it out of the park mm. with this film. Um, you know, I mean, the guy. I I don't think George Miller's made a bad movie. Um, some of his movies are less appealing. Like I'm not really into the Happy Feet stuff, but I also don't think yeah. those are bad movies. Isn't that weird? Isn't it weird? Yeah. Like, um, how he's done a <laughs> he's done a film like Happy Feet. Um, well, he's yeah. he's kind of Fair had point. his leg uh, like uh, a foot in in the world of like children's cinema with like Bay Pig in the City, which is a super weird movie, yeah. but it's it's quite good. Those Happy Feet movies, that kind of thing, and then this other foot in genre films like the you know the Mad Max series yeah. and and this and that kind of thing, and and he's equally good at both. He's just a really good filmmaker. And and given an opportunity, I, I for whatever reason the short form seems to work for him, mm. and he does a great job. Like I said, of, of ratcheting up the tension all through this thing, it it pays off well. Where you get not only the great shot of John Lithgow, like you know, 
oh yeah, I, I'm kind of a hero. I saved everyone. And the reveal, like, oh, he's in a straight jacket now. <laughs> like he's yeah, he, he's just a crazy person. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, just talking about George Miller. Um, I think I read an article on him where he hasn't actually had a flop. So when they when the studios give him money, he has a return on it. Um, not saying that each film has done very well crit- critically or commercially. Talking about Thunderdome, but Thunderdome still made money. Um, and then of course you had his recent instalment of Mad Max with Tom Hardy, um, where studio just gave him about two hundred million dollars. And reading, I, I, I'm sure <laughs> having a read of that, he just was allowed to do what he wanted to do and right uh, let me let me know. go make my masterpiece at the age of like 77 or yes. however old he is yeah, it, yeah. it's right like yeah. the, the thing i love so much about fury road is that like there had been such a drought of good action movies mm. and along comes uh, short of like maybe the john wick films and that kind of thing but certainly we are a far cry from the heyday of the 80s and 90s action film yeah. where there were a lot of them and a lot of them were pretty good. And then steps in George Miller at the ripe, <laughs> you know, it, in his prime, uh, in his mid-70s. And it's just like, well, let me show you, you assholes, how to make an action movie yeah. again. Because yeah. apparently everybody forgot. <laughs> and then just manages to make like not just the, the best movie of his career so far and i hope it goes forever but like one of the best movies of that year of mm-hmm. the decade like it's such a powerful piece of work okay. that i like george miller is just one of those directors that no matter what he does like w- whither he goes i will follow yeah um he, like i will if he makes happy feet 3 or 4 or wherever whatever sequel they're up to i'll be in the theater for that too because i just want george miller to keep making movies until yeah you know he shuffles off this mortal coil <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny how the other thing um i was thinking about this the other day how you get a director that does very well in the studio say you know you're doing great you made us a lot of money and you're making good movies and they just say look there's some money go make the movie that you want to make and for george miller you know, like we said, you know, with Mad Max, um, he's then made Happy Feet. But for I was thinking about Luke Besson. You know, he's he's turned out some really good films. You know, Leon, um, very fast-paced action movies that you know got some sort of espionage involved. And then all of a sudden, it's almost like <laughs> the studio says, "Go make the film." Then we get the Fifth Element. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> You know, yeah. Where the hell did this come from? You know what I mean? It's like, whoa. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's just... yeah, but that that <laughs> stuff is so much. Like, I love it when a director gets gets let loose to do the thing. Like, and in, in full disclosure, I am not the biggest fan of the Fifth Element, mm. but I will readily admit it is a pure work of like creativity and. There's a lot of of great stuff about it. I yeah. need to go back and revisit it because well, the, the the first couple of times I saw it, I was like, I I don't I'm getting stuck on something in this movie. And I don't know what it is. Well, I and, mean, it, and it's it's yeah, just preventing well, me from loving it. I think he just sort of had some fun with it, and I I I, I think it's um, just a little segue onto the Fifth Element. Um, I I grew up with uh, Judge Dredd and 2000 AD and all those characters. Um, and I just thought that Luke Besson turned out probably the best sort of 2000 AD um, type movie that we've seen, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I could think totally about that. see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, also, by the way, if you haven't seen it, there's a great documentary on, on that called Future Shock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's quite good. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, it was a hell of a time in the late 70s, 80s <laughs> in, uh, in the UK. With these guys yeah, and comics yeah. and everything, yeah. Um, it, but it was a lot of fun. Little segue into 2000 AD, but going back to the film, so obviously we've got the terror at 30,000 feet, and I just like the way that it does, um, like I say, you get the beginning, the middle, and the end of this segment where he's coming off, uh, John Lithgow's coming off, he's put into the ambulance. I do like it when the engineers come out and they're very sort of optimistic that it's only going to be 
Oh, it should be just a little fuel leak and the side of the plane's been hacked up. Claw marks coming off it. Oh, hang on. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the the service guy uh, or the the technician being like, what in the hell what happened up there? Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. It, um, it, like, I love the fact that like this is one of those moments, this feels very Twilight Zone to me, where John Lithgow, totally right. Yeah. It was a hundred percent not seeing anything. Wasn't having some, you know, freak out on the plane, unwarranted. Mm. He was right, and he still gets punished for being right. Yeah, and I think, as you said earlier, you, they have closed this off nicely, haven't they? So he's told the story. They don't believe him. He's been taken away in the ambulance. But what you do get here is a moment of oh he could have been telling the truth because we do not know what the fuck that was do you know what i mean what the hell you know you've actually got claw marks so it just gives you that little bit um but what i would have liked to have seen here is dick miller as that engineer do you know what i mean doing his stuff like come on pal come on we're getting paid five dollars an hour here we're gonna get this done do you know what i mean let's sort it out come on schmuck yeah you know what I mean? have, have a little cameo <laughs> yeah on the, on the yeah, back just end the last bit, yeah. totally down <laughs> he does that stuff great <laughs> Oh dear. Um, and then obviously Dan Aykroyd uh, driving the ambulance at the end with a bit of Credence Clearwater Revival. Um, midnight special and uh, yeah, you want to see something really scary? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I heard, heard you had a real scare up there. Mm. Say, you want to see something really scary? Um, yeah, that, that totally works. Like the, the good thing about Twilight Zone the movie is that it ends with a bang. Yeah. You know, like it, the last 30 minutes of Twilight Zone, the movie, are a great time. And and it does make you wish that they had kind of leaned into one thing or the other. Either, hey, let's do a bunch of scary Twilight Zone segments. Or, hey, let's do a bunch of these, you know, parables about the human condition. I would go for the former because I think things hang together a little bit better when you're... You know, it, like it's thematic consistency and tone, right? Like yeah. it, that that's the problem with the movie is that the tone jumps every 25 minutes in the film. And it as a viewer, you know, it you're just uh, like a lot of anthology films. You're at the whim of the filmmakers um, where some if a segment kind of hits some sour notes going into the next segment, you're kind of like a little bummed. You know, like coming off of the Vic Morrow story, I'm not I'm not necessarily having a great time with the movie. And then the kick the can is a little bit better and it has, you know, there's stuff about it that I like, uh, but still I it doesn't blow my socks off. No. And then by the time you get into the Joe Dante segment, which is for my money where the movie really kicks into gear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that I'm still sort of like a little hung over from. A couple of segments that I was more tolerant of than actually enjoying. Yeah, and I, I, I wonder if they, whoever sat down on the editing room, actually had a combination here. So, I mean, could you imagine if this ended on "Kick the Can"? You know. Yeah, yeah. Sense, like, how know? how do you arrange this? I still think I would have started with "Kick the Can," then gone into the Big Moro one, just yeah. because I think that's such a weird entry point into this film. Where it's just like, oh, okay, we're just using the N word in the first five minutes. Great. I, I'd imagine uh, there was probably a, a, a meeting in Hollywood where they were saying, "Well, how the hell do we execute this film um, somehow?" But um, yeah, and especially when you're advertising a movie where one of the actors died, and you're kind of like, well, that's one of the the big problems with the movie is that, especially in that first segment, you can't. All right, for me, I can't help but think of, oh yeah, th this was a movie where someone died, mm. and and this segment in particular, there's a whole sequence we don't see because somebody fucking died. Yeah, and I don't know that at that point, if you're the studio, I'm I'm like, let's just cut bait on this one and just not do this segment and do something entirely different, and so that that's not a con like the movie serves as a weird you know headstone in yeah, to big that, in a lot of ways you know what now you mention that that probably would have been a better way to go to say look 
I think today if that would have happened, they would have said, look, we're going to have to write this one off. And it'll just have to be that segment that we'll chuck in as an extra on some DVD extras. So you get to see bits of it. But we, as a as a tribute to Vic Morrell passing away, we didn't show it, possibly. Yeah, and we're going to do something new. But I, I'd imagine that was probably quite awkward for the uh, studio. And um, yeah, yeah, there are a I lot guess. of bad solutions, not a lot of good ones. Yeah. And yeah, in in retrospect, like I'm sure it, there's something that seems a little insulting about mm. the notion of like, oh, we're going to sweep this under the rug and reshoot this whole first segment and just not do this story. Mm -hmm. And and eh, so you're kind of ignoring what happened, but also, uh, I would argue in the in the grand sweep of history the movie does a better job of standing on its own if it's not living under that shadow yeah yeah and also maybe just gets gets a better segment along the way you know yeah yeah um but the other thing i was going to mention as well is the obviously you had i was thinking about this you had um creep show which was before this wasn't it that was um I think that came out in 1982. I think it was a year before. Uh, I will confirm, but that that sounds right. Um, when was Creep Show? Creep Show is yeah, 82. 82. Um, yeah. And then obviously after this, you have uh, Steven Spielberg went on to go and do Amazing Stories, which I said earlier. I think the Kick the Can feels like a type of Amazing Stories type segment. Um, and then obviously you have the R.L. Stein uh, Goosebumps, which is that horror anthology, which is more directed towards kids. But I've watched some of those with my son, and they're pretty decent. <laughs> There's some pretty decent horror in there um, as a as a kid's entry. Yeah, I speaking of uh, if if I can do a little plug for a great episode of Amazing Stories. Hmm. Um, there is uh, an episode, and I don't know the season, but look up uh, a segment called Mummy Daddy. Oh, yeah. M U M M Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A and it is genuinely one of the funniest, like, 22 minutes of television mm -hmm. I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I think that's right. There's the is it the mummies on the moat? He gets a gets to go ride a motorcycle, doesn't he? I remember. Something yeah, like it's a, it's a guy on a film set. They're making a mummy movie out in the middle of you know some Hicksville, USA kind of swamp. He gets a call from his wife at the local hospital saying that his child's about to be born, and so he takes off to go get to his wife, who's about to you know have his child, and. Uh, and gets lost along the way. He's dressed up like a mummy, and the locals believe that the a mummy that lives in the local legend of the oh, town. Oh yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, that he has returned, and so the the locals set about trying to kill the mummy that has come back to haunt their town while he's trying to get to the hospital. <laughs> and it is incredibly funny brian james is sort of the the main hillbilly mm. um it's it's very very funny uh i i uh what's his name not is it william sanders the guy that's the uh i i, I can't remember his name now but there, there's a handful of character actors mm. in that episode it's just it's terrific i watch it almost every year yeah i remember so, the around um, Halloween. Yeah, because when I see the mummy in the amazing stories, I always think of the mummy out of um, the Monster Squad. You know, similar yeah. type, similar type of thing. You know, it's that. Uh... Yeah. Spoilers: <laughs> there are two mummies in that episode. Uh, yeah, it's it's terrific. It, it, it's so funny, and um, yeah. So I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, Amazing Stories it, it was really the heir apparent to like Twilight Zone, but. Um, you know, in terms of just great anthologies, I, I always think they're tough because, you know, it like, because you're veering so wildly from tone to tone, usually in an anthology film, uh, it, I think it's tough to really make those feel consistent and consistently entertaining. Yeah. 
Um, I would argue one of the best of the recent years is uh, a movie called Southbound. That is a really good horror anthology. It's really weird and offbeat, but it feels of a type. I think they're all directed by the same guy so that it it has more of a consistency to it than, yeah. than some anthologies. I suppose when you think about it, there are an awful lot of anthologies out there because you've got Tales from the Crypt, haven't you? Um, there's another one that doesn't get mentioned that much. is uh, James L. Jones' uh, Grim Prairie Tales. Yeah, with uh, Brad Dourif, I yeah. think, is in that. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, he plays a journalist or something, doesn't he? And he's, he's interviewing this... Um, yeah, is it an Indian chief or something? And he's telling them stories. And it's, yeah, I, I called it one night. Yeah, I think there's some decent segments in there. Um, the more recent one, I think, is well, is uh, Black Mirror, uh, which I think is oh, a for sure. Netflix special. Yeah. Um, and Towers from the Dark Side as well. That's the other one. Um, so yeah, there they're, is they're, a world <laughs> unseen by most. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Tales from the Dark Side. I have a lot of fondness for. I keep meaning to kind of go back and cherry pick some of those episodes. And uh, uh, <laughs> even John Carpenter had a had a go as well, didn't he? <laughs> For yeah, body, body bags. bags. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, he, where he played the, the Morgan and, and which is not bad. It's a pretty good anthology, all things being equal. Yeah, yeah Mark Mark ha uh, Mark Hamill's eye, uh, Stacy Keach's hair, isn't it? Ain't in the in the petrol station one. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, yeah, the yeah. gas station one maybe is my favorite of all of those, mm. but um, yeah, they, I mean they're all pretty good. Yeah. So there's there's whole whole load to go out there, but I suppose in the laws of probability, I don't think any of those have a solid platform do they i think there's one that's better than the other and i suppose that is just i suppose it could be very difficult to try and make an anthology where you're going to say yeah you know what every one of those was solid <laughs> it's probably the ultimate goal for some direct someone out there to say yeah <laughs> so um yeah honestly. yeah They're, but you know like all the vhs movies uh are are kind of of that ilk and uh, ABCs of horror and all that stuff. Like you, 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 if you need a horror anthology, you can certainly find one. Oh yeah. I, I don't. Hmm, I'm trying to think what, what if if someone were to ask me what the best is, it probably Creep Show because um, I think that's the most consistently good. Yeah, I suppose when you look at that one, um, I I actually quite like number two of that as well. Um, I thought there's some decent ones in there, especially the, uh, the was it the monster from the lake? Yeah, that was quite the, cool. The raft, the yeah, raft, that, yeah. The, that story is really good. I don't know that the other stuff in Creepshow 2, uh, for my money, the, that is the highlight of Creepshow 2. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the old cheap wooden head is one that has not, A, has not aged well, and B, was not all that good to begin with. Uh, the Hitchhiker one is fine. That's that, right, that yeah. one's totally yeah. fine. I think the most horrific thing about Creep Show 2 is of the uh, guy's yellow swimming pants, isn't it? <laughs> Look, if we're so, just going to start talking about fashion problems, <laughs> I, I am not. I'm not going to do well in that conversation. <laughs> I, the the number the number of times now that that my girlfriend has said, you know, there's an Eddie Bauer pretty close. <laughs> You know, we should just go one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and maybe you don't just always wear Godzilla shirts. How All about right, that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That, right. And I'm like, are you crazy? That's mm. that's my brand. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I can't talk about fashion negatively uh, too much because I have none of my own. Well, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of victim to that, especially when my missus uh, said we're going out for dinner with friends. You know. And uh, there's me with me uh, Back to the Future uh, T-shirt yeah. on with a calculator watch and with a baseball cap on the other way. And she says, really? And I said, yeah, 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 really. And she went, I'm not going to be able to convince you to take that off of mine. And I said, nah, 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 I'll be all right. And anyway, she oh. goes, okay. And then when I turned up, it was friends of hers. It was friends of hers. I've got to keep this down. She's in the other room. <laughs> 
And yeah. sometimes I do this on purpose because her friends kind of got this sort of certain way of, you know, you know, posh restaurant. And they the look on their face when I turned up and the friend's husband went, oh, hello, RJ, you all right? Went, yeah, and he's looking at me and he's like, really? And I went, yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> I am wearing a Back to the Future shirt, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So, that's how I roll, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll totally forget. And like yesterday, I went shopping in my house VHS t-shirt and oh, yeah. and didn't realize it until I was like checking out. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've got a giant corpse on the front of my shirt. That is probably uh, <laughs> not 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 what they typically see. Um, oh. But, you know. You gotta, hey, look, be memorable. You know, you only got one one ride around this uh, this old marble. So, you know, do what yeah. you like. Yeah. That's my mind. As long as you're not hurting anybody. Like, no, don't be no, one of those sorry. anti-vaxxer assholes. Like, be responsible oh, God, no, to, no, 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 to no, your yeah, fellow yeah. man to some degree. But yeah, yeah, yeah. beyond that, as long as you're not putting someone else in danger, eh, live how you want. Exactly. Whatever, whatever. And yeah. this is all fun. And I think with a lot of people like yourself, people know... And I, I did something one day where I'd, um, I turned up, I think, uh, in just normal everyday clothes. Um, and I turned up at work because I, I drive an old 30-year-old um, Toyota MRT. And mm-hmm. I decided to take in my other car, which is just a you know SUV. And uh, I turned up and the guys went, really? <laughs> Who's just turned up? <laughs> you know, like... Yes, me guys. And they went. We prefer the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's all yeah. for fun. I, I, I jest. You know, I jest. It's, it's just these are these are fun things. These are fun conversations. So yeah, <laughs> it's great. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Bo, it's been great having you on the show. Um, I, you know what? I literally go through the list and I think, oh, let's, let's talk about a weird film. And I'm kind of yeah. going, let's have a look. Uh, cool. Uh, Gary Hill, uh, Darren. Will, and all, oh, yeah, Bo Ransel, right? Yep. Yeah, Twilight Zone, the movie. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll yeah. Do. I know. I, I love this because uh, a little peek behind the curtains. Like, I, from my vantage point, we record these at like 6 a.m. Yeah. And, and so it's the best thing I can do in a day is mm-hmm. have a conversation about a movie, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, in this kind of depth and then go about my day. And it just, it puts me in a great mood the, the rest of the day. Oh, so man. it's, uh, it's wonderful. Some, some bite sized cinema caffeine in the morning for you. Man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool, and, man. and real caffeine too. Caffeine yeah. and, and like a uh, l- little bit of coffee and a little bit of movie chatter and, I'm a pretty happy guy, as it happens. Awesome, man. Well, there we go. That's uh, We've entered the Twilight Zone, the fifth dimension. Uh, like I say, thanks for coming on the show, Bo. Hope you enjoyed that, uh, guys. Um, I'm going to wrap up the show now. Uh, a little bit of admin for the show. Uh, I'm a ma- proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows, including uh, Bo's show, which is uh, Pick 6 Movies and... I know you're doing uh, Duncan and Bo come correct. In fact, Bo, do you want to give us a little bit of a spin on what you're doing next before I close up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in addition to Pick 6 Movies, uh, which you can find over at legionpodcasts.com, um, there's uh, Duncan and Bo come correct, which is a show I've been doing with Duncan McLeish for like seven years now as it oh, happens. Yeah. Um, and we have been doing uh, a look through the canadian horror series slasher mm-hmm. and we are literally this weekend we're wrapping up season two which has been one of the dumbest seasons of television i've ever seen huh. uh it, it's been a tremendous amount of fun and uh, uh also hero hero ghost show which is all about asian horror uh you can check that out and i would encourage people to check out the patreon if you go to patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts um, there's some exclusive stuff there that you're not going to get anywhere else. Like there's a video show that I do called the Ouija experiment experiment, all about movies with Ouija in the title. Um, also a lot of the, uh, other podcasters on Legion podcasts, uh, will drop episodes early or some exclusive shows there. 
So, like, the Patreon is only a couple of bucks, and there's actually a lot of shit uh, there to enjoy. Um, so, I've gotten a lot of good feedback. Like, people who subscribe to the Patreon generally uh, will tell me, like, oh, yeah, we're, we're more than getting our money's worth out of this. And, and it keeps uh, the lights on around here because... Uh, you know, we got to pay for, we, we are truly an independent podcasting network, uh, where we don't depend on any of like, you know, uh, any of the other podcast platforms. We, we are fully self-hosted. So it pays for the web server and it pays for, you know, all the copyright free music and all that kind of stuff that we use. So, um, you know, we really appreciate people who, who come out and, and support us. Uh, and, and also we try to, you know, make sure that if you are kind enough to do so that you are, you are getting some bang for your buck there. And, uh, it, it seems like we are, we are accomplishing that. Okay. Thank you both. Yeah. Appreciate that. So yeah, go and check out the, uh, Legion podcast guys. Um, and let me tell you about what I'm going to be doing next on Bite Size Cinema. So I've got a couple of uh, solo shows coming up, but uh, my next guest is going to be Mark Ball. Uh, we're going to be doing The Evil Dead 2, and that'll be dropping a little bit later in um, September because we've got to try and get recording schedules and things like that. But it's going to be fun to have Mark because I haven't had him on the show, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, also, check out my other show, which is the Mystery Vault podcast. I've just released the... Oh! <laughs> it's completely werewolves. blowing my mind. Werewolves, that's the one. Yeah. The origins of the werewolves and where they came from. So uh, go and check that out. And I've got a Facebook page where I'm most active, so that's the best place to contact me. So you let me know if there's any films that you want me to review. And you can find the show on uh, the Legion podcast, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and several other players. If you type in Bite Size Cinema Podcast, it will take you to a place where you can listen to the show. Yep. Audible. Uh, you're on Audible now. Oh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All over the place. If, if, if you ain't on a platform... If if you were listening to this program and you you could not find uh, Bite Size Cinema on uh, the the podcast platform of your choice, then hit me up and we will correct that because I think we are everywhere. Yeah, we are everywhere for you to listen. We are dominating the world. <laughs> so, okay, That's the then. plan. Yeah. All right, Bo. Well, finishing up on that. Do you want to see something really scary? <laughs> always, always. I'll never say no to that. <laughs> Okay, guys, we'll keep it bite size, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.